सुजीत सर सुजीत सर एम आई ऑडिबल हेलो Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, it's uh, three now. We'll start. So we'll start the session, sir. Yeah. Uh, Pankaj, sir, are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm ready. Okay. 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 Good afternoon. Uh, I request Sujit, sir, uh, to okay, sir, take over the mic and uh, uh, proceed. Uh, start the session. Good afternoon and a hearty welcome to one and all. to the last session of the 6 day national level fdp on cryogenics and superconductivity a research perspective organized by department of mechanical engineering urk institute of technology ponambed this is sujit and as assistant professor department of mechanical engineering it is an immense pleasure to welcome the speaker for this session dr pankaj sagar principal research associate center for cryogenic technology iisc bengaluru who will be speaking on triple r measurements in superconductor cavities on behalf of the staffs of department of mechanical engineering kurk institute of technology and all the participants i would like to extend a very warm welcome to very warm welcome to you sir dr pankaj sagar received his phd degree from department of instrumentation and applied physics indian institute of science bengaluru his btech and mtech degrees in applied electronics and instrumentation from ng university kottayam and kerala university trivandrum he is currently working as principal project associate in center for cryogenic technology iisc bengaluru he has published over 20 articles in both international journals and conferences his areas of research interest include cryogenic sensors cold electronics multi level inverters and power systems it is a pleasure to have you as a resource person sir i'd like to request dr pankaj sagar to continue with the session over to you sir thank you thank you for the warm wel welcome uh, my audio is clear no yes sir it is clear okay fine uh, so the topic that i will be uh, talking about is a part of my research work uh, being a triple r measurement of superconducting rf cavities using non contact measurement methods so i will try to introduce whatever uh, keywords which i have mentioned in the heading uh, you might have had a lot of talk on uh, high temperature superconductors power cable through various other dignitaries in the session Uh, like uh, dr abhay singh gor from iit kharagpur and other dignitaries who might have spoken about uh, i mean spoken about how, what is a superconductor uh, what are its uh, important parameters and all the other uh, 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 details and the basics so i will concentrate on part of um, a slightly different topic uh, related to superconducting rf cavities so this is the overview of the topic i'll just give a brief introduction uh then i'll talk about what are rf cavities srf cavities and uh, why triple r is an important parameter why we should measure it and uh, i will go about uh, explaining three different methods which i have developed uh, during uh, my phd as a part of my phd work and i, I will explain uh, three different methods by which we can extract uh, triple r information uh, using different non contact methods okay now first we'll come into our topic so what is an srf cavity so an srf cavity is the integral component of or the basic constituent of a particle accelerator so you might ask what is a particle accelerator so the first thing i uh, everybody might have heard about is the cern particle accelerator the most powerful particle accelerator known to man uh, which is around uh, say 27 km long stretch of uh, 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 a stretch of an accelerator it's a linear accelerator and the basic constituent of it is a uh, something called an rf cavity or a superconducting rf cavity a srf cavity uh, which is usually made of uh, niobium metal uh, very uh, ultra pure niobium metal so how a particle accelerator works is uh, initially in the olden days uh, if you have a charged particle 
the best way to accelerate is yes obviously you have a high electric potential uh, they used a dc potential and accelerated the particle all the way to the target but the problem with applying a large dc potential is that uh, beyond a particular point there will always be arcing that happens when you are applying a dc potential which means that the energies that the particle can be uh, given is always limited by these factors so the scientists came up with different methods uh, which utilizes ac uh, techniques so basically an rf uh, uh, srf or an rf cavity how they achieve the acceleration of a charged particle is by uh, uh, basically uh, they have a special structure is as you can see from the figure it's a dumbbell shaped structure uh, these dumbbell shaped structures are designed such that Uh, if you have an rf uh, uh, wave uh, uh, an rf uh, energy signal which is being given into this uh, dumbbell shaped structure it uh, it uh, it achieves a resonance uh, depending on the shape of and the structure of the cavity and once it has achieved resonance if you inject a particle a charged particle into the rf cavity at a particular so the timing is a very critical thing but if you inject a particle at a particular time it will experience an acceleration and this acceleration if you have a series of say 27 to now the newer one which is being uh, up the upgraded cern uh, accelerator will have 100 km long length of these particular accelerators stacked in series so each one gives a uh, added acceleration to the charged particle so at that by the time the particle reaches the other end or where the target is uh, which uh, which uh, where the collision happens you will have a velocity is near to 99.9% the or even more compared to the speed of light which means you get a very high acceleration you can impart a large energy to the uh, charged particle so this is the fundamental of a particle accelerator and the fundamental constitution constituent of such a particle accelerator is the rf cavity now rf cavity is uh, uh, fabricated using uh, as i have mentioned before uh, a metal called niobium why niobium is used because niobium uh, becomes superconducting below so it is the uh, if you if you can say it is the uh, metal with the highest uh, i mean the type 1 superconductor with the highest uh, uh, critical temperature its critical temperature is around 9.7 kelvin so if you completely immerse an rf cavity made of niobium uh, in a helium bath it, the whole thing will be uh, uh, superconducting in nature superconducting in nature again uh, my uh, previous dignitaries might have explained it means that zero dc resistance uh, literally zero dc resistance as you can see from the figure at around say 9.7 to 9.5 kelvin your resistance drops to almost like uh, immeasurably low value you can say it as a zero resistance zero dc resistance but when you have an rf signal ac losses are totally different so ac losses will always be there because of something called as a skin penetration depth and the skin effect which happens when you have an rf signal associated with it so uh, so rf losses are there means heat is generated on the surface of this uh, uh, rf cavity so if you have if you do not have some mechanism of transferring the heat generated on the surface of the rf cavity into the surrounding liquid helium bath this they may create hot spots on the surface of the rf cavity which may result in quenching of the rf cavity and that means there is, there won't be any sort of operation so in order to avoid that rf cavities require very high thermal conductivity but as we might have already known it is a very difficult process to measure the thermal conductivity means a, in fact a very accurate measurement of thermal conductivity is pretty difficult but it has been established that there is a direct correlation between electrical conductivity of the material to the uh, thermal conductivity of the material so uh, scientist uh, so uh, scientist uh, scientist figured out that it is much easier to measure electrical resistance and electrical resistance once we are able to measure it we can directly correlate it with our thermal conductivity by a simple relation this relation is only valid at 4.2 kelvin and uh, uh, my triple r which is the parameter which i am measuring which is called the residual resistivity ratio of the material is the resistance or you can say inverse of the conductivity uh, inverse of the conductance so if you have the uh, it is given by the ratio of resistance of the material at 300 kelvin 
to the resistance just above critical temperature so let's assume around 10 kelvin which is just above the critical temperature so if you take the ratio of these resistances you get the uh, triple r so if you have if you if you know the triple r then you can directly measure the uh, uh, thermal conductivity by giving uh, by the relation given in the uh, last point which is just the triple r by 4 which will give the uh, thermal conductivity in watts per meter kelvin so this uh, this relation uh, this relation uh, this rela so electrical uh, conductivity is much easier to measure and triple r also gives a very clear indication of the purity of niobium which means that if you have a uh, niobium of very high purity uh, say of the order of say 100 uh, i mean 300 or above say 500 so usual rf cavities they use uh, niobium base your bulk niobium should have a, a triple r of the order of uh, 300 to 500 uh, 500 so uh, th that is what they usually choose if your uh, triple r value is less than that it means that your material is not pure enough so they don't uh, use such uh, bulk niobium for fabrication but the challenge here is that once you fabricate the fabrication process itself actually varies the uh, or modifies the actual uh, local conductivity of the niobium for example the welding process can change the local conductivity along the welding seams you may have a variation in uh, uh, triple uh, you may have a variation in uh, triple r uh, the, uh, 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 you the cleaning process can vary the triple r so how do you study that because the normal method for measuring triple r is something called as a four wire or a four probe resistance measurement everybody might have studied it uh, during the basic uh, engineering courses a four wire measurement is that you have uh, you cut a piece so basically you cut a piece out of the bulk niobium uh, place four wires uh, on the ends Uh, means you have basically four wires you give current through uh, two leads i uh, mean take uh, give current through one lead take out current through one lead measure across the voltage uh, using two the rest of the two leads so you have four wire measurement and but the problem is that this process is a destructive process so once you have fabricated an rf cavity you can never cut a piece out of that and try to measure the this one and again on top of that this is a uh, it is an average measurement so if you have a piece of uh, a niobium you are measuring the average resistance but uh, what happens to a spot so if i want to measure the changes in uh, resistivity or conductivity at a particular post spot Uh, where i might know see welding is not proper or this may have changed so i need to measure the triple r at that point then this method is not possible so i took up the challenge and thought of some way of uh, uh, how do you uh, measure the uh, triple r without having any contact with the actual target that is measured so that is how i came up with uh, eddy current uh, methods of measurement uh, so Uh, again there was uh, there are a few magnetic uh, methods for uh, measuring the uh, triple r of the material uh, but the problem with this is that most of the materials i mean most of the methods that have been employed are uh, uh, like a calibration method kind of uh, measurement techniques where uh, there are there was there was no direct co uh, like a mathematical correlation that has been shown with the measured value Uh, with the triple r but they do a calibration chart and show that okay this has some correlation and as a result you can get a measure so my way was like what if i use the direct principles of eddy current and from there derive a direct correlation between my uh, triple r values and my uh, 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 triple r I mean, my measured parameter whichever that is so my measured parameter is basically the impedance variations uh, so that is how i started my work Uh, I'll just uh, go around with uh, some of the basic governing equation. Uh, um, you don't have to uh, uh, concentrate too much on this. The basic governing equation for any eddy currents are uh, one is the skin penetration depth given by this delta, uh, which is a, uh, which is inversely proportional to the square root of the applied frequency. Also, the conductivity of the material, which is your target, whatever that is, and then uh, uh, the other two are permittivity and uh, pi, which were constant. then uh, another relation is that it has been shown uh, uh, through uh, rigorous uh, 
mathematical proof that the lift off uh, the slope of the lift off line when you have generated something called as a normalized impedance plot so how you get a normalized impedance plot is just by uh, you measure the impedance impedance means you have your real term and your imaginary part which is your real is the resistance part and the imaginary part will be your uh, 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 which will contain your inductance will be your basically your reactance term uh so you uh, from uh, from measuring that and from measuring uh, the uh, without any target the impedance values without any target you can get a normalized and then you plot it as a normalized so you normalize it by basically dividing it with no uh, no target impedances and uh, you get something a plot similar uh, a plot like this this plot is called uh, basically it has a tear drop shape and the slope of the lift off uh, line is, is is given by this uh, the cot theta and it has a re linear relationship uh, with the uh, basically the delta which is the penetration depth and uh, r basically r by delta where r is a constant depending on your sensor which you have chosen and uh, so from this uh, relation uh, i was able to uh, come up with the relation that uh, you can have so basically a triple r so if you have a sensor i somehow managed to measure the constants a and b at uh, room temperature as well as at cryogenic temperature and then take the ratios of that i should be able to uh, get the triple r without uh, means with uh, as a uh, as a direct function so this was how i approached uh, the problem now how do i do the experiment so what are what is the measurement setup what is the experimental setup that i used yes obviously as i am dealing with a uh, niobium i need temperatures below uh, 10 kelvin so uh, what was available to me was uh, janus uh, super vary temp uh, 400 liquid helium uh, cryostat so basically this is a, a, a liquid helium cryostat Uh, it has an outer jacket uh, with uh, which is uh, usually a nitrogen jacket means uh, the outermost jacket is a vacuum jacket and all the vacuum layers are interconnected so you have a vacuum layer you have a nitrogen jacket then uh, you have another vacuum layer then you have your uh, helium bath uh, and then again there is a vacuum layer and inside which you have uh, your uh, sample positioner rod this is the sample chamber the innermost chamber and inside the sample i mean the sample chamber you have your sample positioner rod and on the sample positioner rod you can place your uh, niobium samples and your sensor and there are feed throughs available at the top and from the feed through uh, you take your electrical connection and based on what measurement you are taking you Uh, uh you basically take out whatever uh, so if it's a, a four wire measurement you have to give your nano voltmeter and your current source and uh, and then uh, connect everything and your temperature measurement everything has to be taken out and then uh, use that data appropriately uh, and there are uh, two basically uh, there are two heaters one is below the uh, needle basically one is uh, below uh, this uh, small uh, needle valve is there and this heater is basically for uh, vaporizing the liquid helium uh, into the chamber and uh, by adjusting a needle valve here you can adjust the flow rate of uh, helium into the uh, liquid i mean the sample chamber and uh, you have basically two feed throughs one, uh, one eight pin feed through and a 10 pin feed through so basically you have only 18 pins to take out your entire electrical connection so so if you have more than one temperature sensor that itself uh, gives uh, eight or uh means a single temperature sensor requires four uh, terminals so feed through availability is also so you have to design based on the availability of your feed through uh, so this is the actual picture of the uh, cryostat that i used for uh, this one and so as i have mentioned before uh, first i need to characterize my sensor to get the sensor. so the, the characterization of the sensor means that i need to acquire the a and b parameter which was mentioned in the previous slide uh, so to get the a and para, uh, b parameter i need to have a number of samples a number of niobium samples with varying triple r so this we acquired through uh, collaboration with uh, iuac uh, in delhi and we got uh, four different uh, samples of varying triple r from uh, 2 all the way to 350 or approximately 350 so we had four different samples so what we did was uh, used three different samples to generate the a and b parameter 
and the fourth sample we used as a uh, unknown uh, measurement and then uh, fig, uh, using the data from the fourth sample uh, and the a and b parameter from the uh, other three samples uh, we would uh, generate the triple r value and see how much it agrees with so this is the uh, the uh, end of the sample positioner rod so as you can see here uh, so this is actually our sensor mounted uh, at some particular distance you have a, a hylum a sample mount you have a, stainless steel uh, spacers which keep the separation at a particular fixed distance uh, between your sensor and you have cernox temperature sensor uh, which is used to measure the temperature below uh, 10 kelvin uh, means other sensors become insensitive so you need some sort of a negative temperature uh, 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 negative temperature coefficient material for measuring the uh, temperature values and uh, so first you need the reference so we had the four samples so how do, so they had given only an approximate so they said oh this will be approximately less than 5 this will be approximately uh, 50 this will be approximately 200 this will be approximately 300 uh, so they didn't give any specific triple uh, r values for the sample that was provided so we had to do our own uh, uh, characterization for that initially we used the usual four wire technique uh, so we put the sample inside the cryostat and uh, using a delta connection of your uh, K3 current source and a volt, nano voltmeter because we, our resistance we are measuring of the order of uh, 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 mostly nano, uh, nano ohms uh, range. Uh, so if you have to measure that, uh, you need very precise current source as well as, well as, as, well as a very precise uh, nano voltmeter. And uh, then uh, uh, once that is, and then also you need to have your temperature compensation methods because the uh, basically the thermal voltages that are generated are much more than your uh, measuring voltage. Uh, so you require some sort of a thermal, uh, thermal uh, compensation techniques, uh, which usually uh, you get by switching the current source uh, uh, by, I mean, you, I mean, you switch the direction of the current and uh, uh, then you take the average of the voltages and based on that you get uh, an accurate reading of uh, your resistance and uh, then you have to get the precise uh, temperatures you have a combination of a heater and the Cernox temperature sensor and both are coupled to a, a lakeshore temperature controller uh, which will be running in a PID loop uh, which will set the temperature at a precise voltage so if I need a 10 Kelvin it will set it at uh, that 10 Kelvin and keep it at that temperature so that I can take multiple uh, uh, measurement values. Uh, so this was the first uh, set of experiments. So we took the four uh, samples. So here you have the four sa uh, samples. So once we measured it, we found that oh, less than five triple R we got uh, was at uh, 3.21, precisely 3.21. So the high triple R values to measure it is very easy. Very easy in the sense it is much more easier compared to your uh, uh, higher triple R values. Your low triple R values, you get like a very clear transition uh, it'll be a very straight line, linear uh, drop because it's a resistance of uh, metal. So you have a very linear drop and below 50 Kelvin, it starts to saturate. And at around uh, nine point, uh, as you can see from the figure at around 9.7 volts, suddenly it will drop to zero resistance. But uh, initially when we checked with your higher, our higher uh, triple R values, uh, you can see that uh, if you plot it on a, uh, on a normal scale, you cannot see the jump. Then what we did when you you zoom it in only you can see that at around 9.7 suddenly because your uh, resistivity values had gone below 10 power minus 10 so it is a uh, 0.1 uh, nano ohm meter range so still but you can see that a very clear transition is happening and higher triple r values means that transition becomes shorter and shorter so it becomes even more difficult to get that precise jump but uh, we were able to get it using uh, precise instrumentation and uh, we got the exact triple r values uh, which is like uh, dividing this value of resistivity to this value of resistivity uh, so you get the precise values for all of these and it was 3.21 58.2 259.259 uh, and 367 so which is a wide range of triple r so we were confident okay this will be good enough to calibrate or uh, prove our method for measurement now, once we have this, uh, now we go into our non-contact based uh, measurement techniques. 
So to to measure uh, basically non-contact based measurement means yeah, it's an eddy current measurement system. So we developed a, a multi-layer inductor uh, sensing element uh, which is uh, based on a PCB based. So it's a, a, a G10 CR which is a cryo compatible PCB. Uh, and then uh, it has five layers of uh, basically it has five layers of inductors and uh, uh, made with an array of inductors so these arrays are made uh, which will become clear in the later chapter it is mainly for compensation and to get the uh, reference values at particular temperature so if i have sample at one of these i can take the other or if i have sample at two of these then i can take the other two as a reference because the other two are not under the influence of the um, a target material also uh, and then uh, at that particular temperature as these are almost identical inductors i can get the reference inductance value from the other two so that is how we designed the inductor but again uh, and then uh, what we are measuring is the impedance impedance means you have your real value which is your uh, r and then you have your imaginary part which is your uh, uh, which which contains your uh, L, uh, which is your uh, series inductance values. Now, uh, the uh, tricky business is that uh, you need to have a very precise uh, thermal compensation at each of these temperatures, because uh, if you are creating a probe, because your standard probes do not work when you have a cryostat and you have lines going in. So what you have to initially do is, uh, uh, once you have connected the probe, you need to do the thermal compensation, which is your open circuit and short circuit compensation at whatever temperatures you are measuring. And once that compensation is achieved, you have to apply these compensation at the temperatures. And then with the sample also, you have to apply these compensation. So it's a very tedious process, which you have to follow in order to get accurate measurement. But once you do all these things, you will get a very precise uh, measurement. So we used a, a key site impedance analyzer, a very costly uh, instrument uh, along with our uh, uh, helium cryostat. Now uh, question will come. So what happens? So you are saying you have used a multi-layer inductor, a basic PCB based uh, inductor coil. Uh, uh, if you cool it down, will it break or will it have warping or will it shift its parameters? So uh, definitely you have to first study what happens. So you don't have a target. You are simply cooling the sensor. What happens to it? So by, by logic or by theory, uh, inductance is not a function of temperature in any way. Inductance does not have a temperature dependent term at all. So it is only, a, so it's a, basically it, it is a function of the dimension of the coil and the number of turns. Uh, so if you if all these things are constant, then your inductance, uh, if you at a particular frequency, should not vary. But that is what we see till at a, till a particular temperature, like only a very minor variation. But uh, below say 50 Kelvin at lower frequencies, below 50 Kelvin or uh, even below 75 Kelvin, you can see a drastic decrease in the inductance, like around two pf change in, I mean uh, two micro Henry change in uh, inductance, which is a very large value. So, uh, so in uh, so we had to study why why this was happening. So this uh, initially this was uh, a, a neglect ignored by me uh, in the fact that we were taking at only a particular temperature and we were also taking a reference value at that temperature and we were compensating for that. So this shouldn't come into picture. But when you are developing a sensor, you need to characterize it and you need to know why such a response happens. So uh, to study this, uh, we, uh, we used a series of experiment as well as uh, simulation techniques. So what we did was, oh, okay, if it's a dimensional thing, so what happens if my inductor is warping? Is it due to some sort of a warping uh, that my inductance is varying? Or is it due to some other phenomena that is happening, which I haven't uh, considered? Uh, so to study the warping effect, what I did was uh, uh, take, uh, so this is a multi-layer inductor with five different layers. I took the first and second layer and measured the inner layer capacitance between this. So capacitance is also a function of the distance between the plates as well as the overlapping area. And then uh, uh, reduce the temperature. And we found that capacitance was reducing in an orderly manner. And initially we thought, okay, this may be this capacitance reduction um, may be, uh, so this may be uh, uh, due to uh, warping of the inductor. And this can, uh, in fact, may explain the changes in inductance. 
but we found out that uh, once we simulated the uh, so we basically simulated uh, uh, in ansoft maxwell uh, 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 our the exact same dimension of our uh, uh, sensing coil uh, not the array based one but a single uh, inductor based one and we found that warping was happening but the values of warping were very small and that too it was occurring only at the edges and that too uh, the change in capacitance that was happening was not due to the warp the effect of warping was negligible but the uh, primary effect that was changing the capacitance was the uh, permittivity variation that happens due to uh, due to temperature so the inter intermediate layer in the capacitor is an fr4 uh, i mean basically g10 cfr4 so this the permittivity varies with temperature um, and it changes from 4.4 value to 3.2 which was unexpected because in all simulation usually you take in the, uh, your permittivity values as constant or whenever you disagree and you do not have any sort of uh, standard values for permittivity at uh, lower temperatures because these are not available there um, there have been uh, very few experiments which shows uh, how the permittivity electrical permittivity varies with uh, temperature Uh, so uh, we were surprised that uh, that was the effect, and when we fit fitted that with the capacitance, it was following a very clear trend. So that was not the reason for this sudden variation in the inductance. Uh, then we figured out, okay, this may be due to the uh, mute the eddy current. So basically, what is happening is the single the first layer of the inductor. Uh, when uh, when excitation is happening, the second layer of the inductor acts as the target for the first layer. and this effect is happening due to the uh, the basically the resistivity change of the second layer means all the layers are changing in the same way your resistivity but uh, it is uh, it is an effect of uh, it is an indirect effect of the resistivity change of the coil itself and compounded by the uh, eddy current effect so this itself we were able to uh, publish as a, a detailed study uh, so that was very interesting Uh, so once we have characterized the sensor okay so then we have studied that okay this sensor works perfectly at 4 kelvin there is no the distortion is negligible and once you have some compensation techniques all your other effects can be cancelled now the next uh, thing that should be considered is yes so you have your uh, standard values of uh, uh, your standard values of triple r now based on this standard values of triple r uh, you have to generate your Uh, so uh, now uh, uh, what you did is i took a, a sample of unknown triple r unknown triple r means which has not been used for generating the a and b values and then from there we got the cot theta value or the slope of the lift off line and then applied it uh, uh, applied it uh, to the uh, uh, basically uh, ah so this is basically to uh, it's a representation of your uh, lift uh, normalized impedance plots as you can see uh, basically this is the procedure we uh, did this with all the unknown samples no, not all the unknown samples the three of the unknown samples uh, i mean three of the known samples and then uh, generated this uh, graph which is the slope of the lift off line versus r by delta graph and you get a linear relation as has been predicted uh, by the literature and from there you get the a and b values and this a and b values then you take the unknown sample and uh, measure again do the same thing you get the l0 values ls value l0 is the inductance without target ls is the inductance with the target similarly you have r0 and rs uh, at uh, both the temperature your uh, to uh, uh, 300 kelvin as well as your uh, 10 kelvin and then uh, based on uh, the values of the slope uh, of the unknown uh, inductance you uh, substitute it for your a and b values in the previous equation and you generate the triple r so we found out that uh, uh, the triple r was uh, through uh, through this method from the equation we were able to calculate the triple r as uh, 255.3 and the actual value that was measured using our uh, uh, four wire method was uh, 259 which is a very close perception so the error is only 1.42% whereas uh, all the other literature which has non contact methods usually come in the range of 10 to 15 percentage error which is which is very very uh, low accuracy but we were able to get the very high accuracy but the process is very data intensive you need a law, large number of data points and then based on that you have to generate the calibration chart for your uh, a and b which is a sensor dependent parameter so if you have a different sensor you again have to get a, a different 
different a and b values and based on the a and b values you can then do uh, just a single experiment and get the uh, triple r value so that is how we were able to uh, measure the triple r using the based on the first principles now i wanted to make it uh, no okay this is this works perfectly but the problem is very data intensive i needed some way by which to reduce the uh, steps involved in this uh, process so i thought okay let me see so anyway we know from the eddy current laws that uh, the skin penetration depth is a function of uh, the uh, target uh, conductivity as well as the frequency of operation and uh, so uh, if if you have a target of a, uh, a specific thickness and then you know the conductivity then uh, beyond a so if you are changing the frequency beyond a particular frequency basically the eddy currents has to Uh, completely envelop the uh, target itself so after that point you have a ch ch slope uh, you have basically a change in slope when you measure the inductance of the uh, this one so this this point is called as the uh, inflection point so uh, so again the what uh, i proposed was okay you have in, you have uh, a similar inflection point at room temperature you have a similar inflection point at cryogenic temperature and once uh, you know the frequency at which this inflection point happens the inflection point is nothing but the change in slope uh, uh, the point at which the slope changes so once you have figured out the inflection point at uh, two different uh, temperature which is at your uh, 4.2 kelvin as well as your i mean your uh, 10 kelvin as well as your 290 kelvin you just check the ratio of the inflection point then theoretically you should be able to get the triple r uh, only if your uh, thickness remains constant so that is an error because uh, uh, you know it is a known fact that if you cool any material its uh, dimensions will change but that is a predictable change so i can always uh, incorporate that uh, change in the thickness into my final measurement and get a more accurate value so i tried this method so i do not have to measure the impedance in fact so uh, here i do not require to measure the uh, uh, the real part which is your resistance measurement and your inductance measurement i just need to get the inductance measurement uh, with a sweep of the frequency versus the inductance measurement and figure out where the inflection point happens and uh, so i wrote a program basically uh, we developed a program which will get the inflection point from the uh frequency versus uh, frequency versus uh, inductance uh, characteristic so we did it for the different samples that we had uh, you can uh, see that uh, we have the program gave that uh, inflection point at 17.1 kilohertz and at uh, uh, lower frequency because the conductivity becomes very high Uh, at around uh, 10 kelvin the conductivity becomes uh, very high that uh, frequency has gone down to 69.9 uh, hertz so if my uh, triple r is even more then this becomes less than 20 kelvin which is uh, less than the resolution of my measurement instrument which means i won't be able to measure it so that is one limitation which we found with this measurement technique similarly we took the other samples and then we took the ratio of the inflection point frequency so this is the chart so we found that yes uh, so when we did the ratio the calculated triple r was coming at 3.19 61.28 and 244.46 uh, with uh, these are the uh, percentage errors that happened uh, and it is around 5 to 6% which is also a very good um, uh, percentage deviation compared to other non contact based measurement method but here the major limitation was that i needed so uh, if the triple r is very high then uh, uh, my measurement system will not be able to measure it because frequency becomes very low or i need a very very thin sample uh, so that uh, that uh, thickness uh, is uh, so your frequency can be relatively high so uh, these factors have to be considered while uh, selecting i mean when you are trying to measure the uh, sample so this method gave me the advantage that my process the steps for uh, calculating the triple r was much less compared to the previous method but the major limitation was that uh, uh, the thicker samples uh, uh, i couldn't measure so if i have an actual rf cavity which has a uh, which has a fairly good uh, thickness then i won't be able to measure the triple r using this method but if i have a target if i have a thin film coated sample this is an optimum uh, method so now the uh, advanced uh, 
uh, research is happening where we have uh, RF cavities which have copper as the base material and you coat niobium on top of it. So that coated uh, RF cavities, this becomes a very uh, viable source for viable technique for measuring the triple R. And the errors are also uh, within, uh, I mean, uh, much better than uh, other non-contact based methods. But I wanted to take it a, a step further because here also I required some type of measurement of uh, inductance, which is which is again requires a uh, at least a, uh, a costly uh, uh, LCR meter or an impedance analysis. So I wanted to take that also out of the picture and have an encapsulated sensor which should be able to, so if I keep it near to my RF cavity, uh, uh, anywhere in that proximity, and from the simple uh, measuring values of the uh, sensor, I should be able to calculate the triple R. So I thought of, okay. Uh, so I thought of using some sort of an electronics based uh, technique for uh, uh, obtaining the uh, triple R values. Based on that, so how I came about is that, uh, I took the, uh, so you can see, so this is uh, as I have shown below uh, uh, in the first slide. So this is like the triple R versus uh, our temperature. You have the material, it's a resistance, uh, resistivity drops, 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 and at the critical temperature, it goes to zero. Now this is again, uh, this is the inductance of a sensor kept in the proximity of that target. And I am measuring the inductance over the temperature you can see that inductance also has a very similar trend uh, to the resistivity of the material. And then inductance also drops to a very small value. So this, this correlation showed that, okay, so there might be a direct correlation, means I can use a direct correlation between the inductance itself without using the resistivity values and use that to calibrate my triple uh, R. So yes, this, this will again be a calibration method, but this will be a much more easier and simpler method and cost-effective method because it's a encapsulated, it's a simple encapsulated sensor. So now how do you convert this inductance values, which uh, I have mentioned in the previous uh, uh, data into some sort of a measurable value. So inductance is, uh, uh, so I thought of uh, converting the inductance values to frequency values and uh, uh, frequency values using something called as an uh, LC oscillator circuit. So oscillator circuit, this inductance becomes part of the oscillator circuit. So here you have four different inductors, all goes through the same LC oscillator circuit. I achieved this through a uh, multiplexer uh, electronic circuit. And uh, all of this has been designed to work at four Kelvin, which required a lot of other uh, design and uh, me mechanical testing, electrical testing of the components at uh, lower temperatures because most of the electronics fail at uh, cryogenic temperatures. So you need specialized circuits and specialized uh, 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 components. Uh, even the passive components have to be selected very precisely to work at four Kelvin. Uh, so, what we achieved was again uh, why I require why I thought uh, why I needed a single uh, LC oscillator is to uh, is to account for the variability of uh, the different uh, components because uh, if I am saying see if I have four different coils and four of them uh, I am uh, giving it to four different LC oscillator circuits because of the variation in the individual components which may not be exactly matching with the other. I may have differences in the measurement values. So if I have only a single LC oscillator circuit and I am feeding my in all the inductance through the same uh, LC oscillator itself, I should be able to compensate for uh, most of the variation that is happening. And again, uh, another advantage is that uh, when I'm measuring, I keep two of the uh, uh, two of the coils as reference. And then I subtract whatever uh, temperature variations are happening in the frequency only due to the temperature, I mean, so whatever temperature variation that are happening in the other inductors, which are not in the presence of the target, uh, so that all the other effects, such as maybe the warping of the coils or ex external effects of the, uh, 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 means other parameters are completely canceled off and only the inductance, uh, only the inductance variation due to the resistivity variation of the target is highlighted. So this circuit was, uh, so we designed the circuit and tested it uh, through an extensive process at uh, four Kelvin. So the entire uh, circuit is capable of working at uh, 4.2 Kelvin or even below that and uh, found to be uh, working uh, properly. Uh, 
uh, then uh, so the, basically this is the uh, da data acquisition and the multiplexing uh, schematic uh, that we developed so basically it has a switching circuit uh, so the lab view uh, program will send uh, switching signals through an ni uh, card into the electronic uh, multiplexer. So multiplexer will switch among each of the inductors. And then uh, you have again your CERNOX for measuring the temperature and a heater to adjust the uh, temperature of the target. And uh, the entire thing is, uh, so the sensor along with the electronics goes inside the uh, cryostat. So why is this required is another question. The simple answer is that you are measuring inductance. Inductance means is basically a coil. So if you have large connecting wires that are taking uh, the inductance values outside the cryostat and using some other measurement technique means the entire uh, the noise and other errors that happen due to the different uh, thermal gradient along the cryostat will affect the final measurement of inductance. So in order to avoid that, I had to have my sensing element as well as my target, uh, I mean, uh, my sensing uh, coil uh, and the sensing uh, uh, control circuitry as close to each other as possible so that all these are avoided. So uh, based on that only we developed the uh, data acquisition and the circuits. And first we had to characterize. So what we did was, okay, you just cool the sensor down to uh, uh, 4.2 Kelvin. So, okay, without any target. So we can see that, yes, frequency is varying. This is expected because all the uh, resistance values changes. So this is just a representative of uh, one of the inductors. All four will have the same kind of variation. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, it varies from say 115 uh, kilohertz to around 145 to 146 kilohertz, just by variation in temperature without any target. So how do I cancel it out? So I took a reference inductor again, kept in the same, this one. And when I subtracted it, uh, means basically uh, when I subtracted it from the reference, I'm having a variation over the entire range of temperature, only a variation of around uh, 300 Hertz, which is very low compared to my measurement signal. So I, uh, this produces very low error in that way. So I'm able to cancel out most of the effects of the uh, other, uh, the common uh, aspects of uh, the sensing. And then again, we kept each of the, uh, uh, basically we get, uh, kept each of the uh, triple R material in the proximity of the target and then cooled it down to 4.2 Kelvin and measured the frequency. So you can see initially it was uh, touching at 4, 145, whereas when we have the uh, target, it goes to around 185 kilohertz and uh, you have a uh, gradient and this is just the frequency variation. Now, once you cancel out the effect of the uh, reference, you have a variation. So if you have a low triple R value, you have a variation of say from 20 kilohertz to only 24, 25 kilohertz. Whereas uh, if you have a very high triple R, you have a variation from say 22 uh, to 20, uh, 22 kilohertz to around uh, 40, uh, around 38 kilohertz. So the deviation is very large and it's a function of triple R. So it is very obvious from the, uh, the graph. So then what we did was uh, basically you have to curve it. So this is the limitation of this technique. So this graph to curve it properly, you need a large number of uh, data points. So we have tried to acquire and we are, we are also trying to uh, acquire a large number of samples so that we can calibrate our sensor, our triple R measurement technique with a large number of uh, data. Uh, so if you have everywhere from triple R from uh, one to say 1000, if you have a large number of samples, this will become much more accurate. And any, any uh, triple R in between these ranges could be measured very accurately. So, uh, we, but uh, when we try, when we measured the percentage errors were coming in the region of 10%, uh, which is also still very, uh, very good compared to other uh, non-contact based measurement techniques, but not as accurate, as accurate as the previous techniques. But the advantage is that it is, a, it does not require any sort of uh, complex machinery uh, to measure because you are just measuring frequency. Frequency means a uh, uh, five rupee uh, uh, counter circuit can do it. So you do not require complex circuitry to measure the uh, triple R, just that your sensor, uh, you uh, need the sensor and keep it in the proximity and just measure the triple R. And you can also, the other advantage is that if you have an array of these sensors, you can easily measure uh, the whatever the in the, uh, triple R changes along the curvature of the 
uh, R of cavity, which means that uh, uh, basically you can characterize the R of cavity along the welding seam, which was my uh, initial goal. So we were able to show that. Uh, 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 so basically, three different. So I was. Uh, we were able to develop three different techniques uh, for measuring triple R. Uh, uh, the first technique was a data intensive process and it required a large, basically it required uh, like uh, hundreds of Excel sheets and generating the uh, uh, normalized impedance plot, which itself takes a large number of data. And from the normalized impedance plot, you have to generate your uh, uh, slope of the lift off line. And from the slope of the lift off line, you have to generate your uh, triple R values. Uh, once you have got your calibration, I uh, mean, once you have got your A and B, which is your uh, sensor dependent parameter, uh, which is a data intensive process, but it's a very accurate uh, uh, measurement technique. Uh, we were able to publish that in uh, measurements uh, uh, last year. And uh, uh, whereas uh, the second technique is much less data intensive, but still requires a, a sensitive instrument like an LCR meter or an impedance analyzer. Uh, you just need to find the inflection point and uh, an automated uh, um, lab view program was uh, basically uh, created to uh, exactly figure out where the inflection point is happening from the changes in the slopes. And uh, just by getting the uh, inflection point and uh, taking the ratio, you could uh, figure out the triple R. And the uh, next, uh, uh, the final technique, uh, which was the electronics based one, uh, is a very promising technique. Uh, and we were also able to, so uh, the limitation was that we didn't have a large number of samples. Uh, if we had a large number of samples, we would have been able to get uh, much better accuracy. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and one more thing is that the major drawback of the second method is that if you have a uh, target with large thickness, so if it is a bulk niobium or if you have your uh, RF cavity based on uh, bulk niobium, it becomes difficult to measure the triple R. Uh, but if it's a coated or a thin film niobium uh, based RF cavity, it becomes much more easier to measure. Uh, so uh, that is uh, all about uh, uh, the different uh, triple R measurement techniques. Uh, we were able to publish uh, different uh, publications based on this work and also a patent based on this work. And uh, these are some of the journals that uh, we ourselves have uh, uh, published and uh, some of the conferences. Uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone uh, who has given me the opportunity. I know it's a, a short session, but uh, uh, I, uh, three o'clock means I didn't want to go beyond the one hour mark. So I kept it short. Uh, so uh, that's about it. If you have any questions, you can uh, uh, ask. Thank you, sir. Yeah. The participants, if you have any question, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question. So there is a question. Yeah. Uh, it is from Kiran Kumar Rokde. Okay. He's asking uh, what happens when thin wire, it's 15 yeah. micron, is subjected to cryogenic, like its characteristics. He's asking about the characteristics. What happens to a thin wire uh, of 15 micron when it is subjected to cryogenic treatment? Uh, so, uh, uh, is it a material question or uh, so? Uh, I will answer from the point of view of uh, electrical uh, or an electronics engineer. So if you are asking about the electrical properties, uh, so if I am measuring the resistance, what happens is your resistance. If you are taking a metal, uh, if you are taking a metal, metal means it is a positive temperature coefficient material, which means that uh, if your temperature increases, your resistance increases, and if your resistance, if your temperature decreases, your resistance decreases. Not uh, so if uh, your resistance decreases, decreases linearly. If it's a metal, it decreases very linearly to a point, that point usually around 20 Kelvin. And, and then it saturates to a saturation value depending on the impurity content in the material. So if you have a very high uh, purity, it may saturate to a different value. If you have a, a less uh, pure material, it may saturate to a different value. So where it saturates depends on the impurity content, but it behaves a linear trend uh, towards your uh, lower temperature region. And in terms of material properties, Nardik sir yesterday might have explained uh, much better the changes in uh, when you do a thermal cycling material properties changes and uh, uh, your uh, basically your lattice structures uh, changes are happening. All these are there. Uh, this is just from the perspective of an electrical uh, measurement.
okay sir so any other participants if you want to ask uh, the question please uh, unmute yourself and then can ask your question i guess there are no questions if at all there are any questions uh, uh, we'll be sharing the email id of uh, the resource person yeah. would that be better yeah okay thank you dr pankaj sagar for engaging this Thanks. session in spite of your busy schedule and sharing uh, knowledge on triple r measurements in superconductor cavities it is indeed a very energetic interesting and productive session sir thank you so much thank you thank you for giving me the opportunity i thank everyone in the team uh, for organizing it in a, such a, a timely and orderly fashion uh, and uh, it was very enlightening to hear the talk of uh, some of my colleagues along with some of the uh, other professors from different uh, departments uh, who even i have collaborated with some of them and the works are uh, really enlightening and it is a uh, uh, i am uh, uh, i am very uh, uh and i'm like surprised to see that uh, the institute is able to get uh, very eminent personalities in the area of cryogenics and talk uh, uh, in detail about different topics uh, and uh, i hope that this uh, continues for uh, the future and you, you keep on uh, inviting uh, uh, the eminent personalities and i would be glad to uh, join as the viewer in uh, your program thank you so much sir thank you for your great, wonderful gesture may i now request professor ganesh m convener of fdp to present the report of this fdp yes thank you sir sir am i audible yes sir okay sir yes our uh, dear participants uh, we are about to conclude this uh, six day national level uh, faculty development program and cryogenics and superconductivity a research perspective being the convener of this uh, faculty development program it's my responsibility to mention the highlights uh, of this uh, each session of this uh, faculty development program uh, the motivation behind organizing this uh, faculty development program is to enlighten the minds of members of research minds of members of research and academic community to the area of cryogenics and superconductivity each session of this fdp was delivered by the eminent resource persons who are having vast knowledge and experience in the field of cryogenics and superconductivity and we had a participants who are registered from all over india the six days fdp comprised of nine sessions session 1 is about introduction to cryogenics and its applications and session 3 was about cryo coolers which was delivered by professor srinivasan kasturi rangan who is a retired professor and scientist in the center for cryogenic technology iisc bangalore the talk delivered was very fluent and effectively conveyed to all of us the session two was about design and development of india's first superconductor cable which was delivered by dr abhay singh gor who was an assistant professor in cryogenic department iit kharagpur he has given the details about his research work in the development of india's first superconductor and i believe this his work inspired all the participants in identifying the unexplored area for research in the field of superconductivity session 4 and 5 is delivered by professor upendra behra who is a, who is a principal research scientist for center for cryogenic technology iisc bangalore on cryogenic storage and transfer system and in the other session he delivered a talk on vortex tube the session was very informative and knowledge shared by the resource person will surely benefit the participants session 6 was on cryogenic treatment on metals which was presented by professor d s nadig who is a principal research scientist iisc bangalore he highlighted about improving the life span of metals by subjecting them to cryogenic treatment the information shared by professor nadig 
will benefit the participants involved in research on material properties. Session 7 was delivered by BVAS Gurudidhar, Manager, R&D Division, BHEL, Hyderabad. He highlighted about HCS coils, that is high temperature superconducting coils and scope for research in the field of superconductivity. Session 8 was engaged by Dr. Ravi Verma, who is assistant professor in NIT Jalandhar, Punjab, who on development of cryocooler based uh, uh, cryocooler based high performance cryoabsorption pump, who delivered a talk on development of cryocooler based high performance cryoabsorption pump. Also, he shared his experience, experience on his research work. Session 9 is about triple R measurement of superconducting RF cavity using non contact measurement methods by Dr. Pankaj Sagar, who is a principal research, research associate, IAC Bangalore. Uh, definitely, his learnings and experience of uh, Dr. Pankaj Sagar during his research work shared with us was very informative. Finally, I believe that the takeaways from this uh, six days national level faculty development program will definitely benefit all of us in our profession. And I will, and it's for me, it's a time for me to use this platform to thank each one of them who directly or indirectly supported in successfully organizing this FTP. First of all, I would like to thank all the resource person from IAC, IIT Karakpur, NIT Suratkar, sorry, NIT Jalandhar, and, and uh, Prof, uh, Mr. Mulidhar from BHEL Hyderabad. So they have accepted our invitation very kindly and they have given their precious time, okay, in delivering their talk. And also, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Nagendra, who is a research associate in Indian Institute of Science in the Department of uh, Center for Cryogenic uh, Technology, Center for Cryogenic Technology. Because of him, we are able to convince or bring all these resource persons to this faculty development program. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nangedra, for your kind support in organizing, organizing this event. And also, I take this opportunity to thank our management of Kodawa Education Society and also principal, Kurg Institute of Technology and Team IAG, head of the department, Department of Mechanical Engineering for their support in organizing this event. And also, I wholeheartedly thank all my fellow colleagues, okay, who supported and helped in making this event a very grand success. And last but not the least, the very important uh, personalities of this uh, uh, faculty development program, that is our participants, without whom this event won't be a successful. I thank wholeheartedly all the participants who have actively participated in this event. Thank you one and all. Thank you very much. Please, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Ganeshir. I request all the participants to give the feedback of the session. The link will be shared in the chat box. These certificates will be mailed to all the uh, uh, to your registered email ID. Signing off. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Pankaj sir. Thanks to be a part of this session. So participant, if you want to share or give any oral feedback about this FTP, can share.